Hello, and welcome to the Shifting Culture Podcast, in which we have conversations about the culture we create and the impact we can make. I'm your host, Joshua Johnson. Go to shiftingculturepodcast.com to interact or donate. If you're enjoying this show, it would really help us out if you left a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or share this show with your friends or network. Previous guests on the show have included Alan Hirsch, Rob Wagner, and Pam Arland. You could go back and listen to those episodes and more. But today's guest is Michael Frost. Michael is an internationally recognized Australian missiologist and one of the leading voices in the missional church movement. He is the author or editor of 19 books, the founder of the Tinsley Institute, the missional Christian community Small Boat, Big C, and one of the founders of Forge Mission Training Network. We have a wonderful conversation on what it means to be missional and Christ-centered at the same time. This is a good one. I know you're going to enjoy it. I certainly did. This episode is brought to you by All Nations Kansas City. At All Nations, we make disciples and train leaders to ignite church planting movements among neglected people. And we want you to join us. Are you tired of compromising for the status quo? If so, come join us on the leading edge. All Nations is not just a great missions training and sending organization. It's an organization that I've been a part of for many years. So join me at All Nations Kansas City. Go to allnations.us for more information. This podcast is done in association with the MX Platform and 100M Publishing. Do you want to be resourced and equipped to release movement in your context? Connect with movement leaders and practitioners for coaching, resources, and training at the mxplatform.com. And our guest today, Michael Frost, has a couple of books on 100M Publishing. One is Read Jesus that he co-wrote with Alan Hirsch, revised and updated edition, the yellow edition. You got to get that one. It is amazing. And then he wrote a little uh, afterward in Red Skies, which is another amazing book that you should get. So check those out at 100M Publishing. Mike, welcome to the podcast. I'm really excited to have you. So thanks for coming. Hey, Joshua. It's great to be here. As you've been, you know, very uh, missional, calling the church into missions activity to get people out on the edges. And as you've been around the edges of the kingdom and trying to pull the church in that direction, how do you stay uh, centered uh, on Jesus through it all? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, and it's, it's a very multi-layered question, too, yeah. because I guess in some respects, I, I would certainly I do want the church to kind of move out from within being a kind of a insular and cloistered kind of community to engage yeah. in society and culture and, and, uh, and to move out to uh, be a missional presence. But not just so that it's more relevant or so that, kind of engages more people or grows more or what have you it would be my primary motivation for it would be because that's how we mirror the kind of the heart and character of god that, that mm. god is a missional god that even that ex- that that <laughs> sentence isn't doesn't bear the gravity of what i'm wanting to say but yeah i mean at, at, at the core of christian theology that is thinking about god is the idea that God extends himself beyond himself mm. in the creation of the universe, in, in, in his relationship with humankind. Uh, uh, you know, the expression that's used, the Latin phrase, missio dei, the, you know, this, yeah. this mission of God. God is constantly, I mean, that's another definition for the word love, to extend oneself beyond yourself for the benefit of others. And that's God. That's how God mm. operates all the way through uh, his engagement with the first covenant people uh, in the Old Testament, yeah. and then uh, of course we see that in Jesus that you know he's the sent and sending God that God sends. I say sent and sending because God sends His Son, but His Son is God, so He's sending Himself in a yeah. sense. And and even our most complex doctrinal view, the kind of the the, um, the Trinity is like soaked in this whole idea of mission because lots of people kind of speculate about what the relationships between the three persons of the Trinity might be like. But one thing we can be certain from Scripture is that they send each other. God the Father sends God 
the yeah. Son, and then God, Father, God, the Son, send God, the Holy Spirit. I mean, at the very core of the, the interpersonal relationships between the three persons of the Trinity is sentness, if you yeah. So, So this idea, well, you know, come on, church, we should be the sent ones. We should be extending ourselves beyond ourselves, outward into society, into culture, into the lives of the hurting or the poor or the needy or the lost. Yeah. It's not just because it's a good strategy or because they need it. Both of those things might be true. But I would say because this is what God looks like. And, <laughs> and if we're wanting to mirror God in this world, yeah. we want to be Jesus. The One of the things you could say that Jesus without question is he's a sent one. Mm. He says it like uh, 20 times, I think, in, in John's gospel, that, mm. you know, the Father has sent him, or I have been sent to do this, um, this fulfillment of this idea of what he was sent to do. So if we want to be like Christ, then being sent people is, I think, at the, the very core of that. There are other things you could say, but yeah. at the core. So, yeah, yeah I would say, you know, uh, it, it's about um, mirroring the, the, the character of God, and it's about emulating the life and work of Jesus. So to your question, how do you stay centered on Jesus? It's like, you know, how else would we know what it looks like for us to be engaged in mission if we don't continually go back to Jesus as our kind of touchstone? Yeah. Um, and if you don't, Joshua, I think you end up, you know, thinking, well, if you think the mission of the church is to grow the church and to get out there and, and, engage in strategies to connect to people and you don't have jesus as i said that touchstone yeah. that 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 frame that that shapes the way you do that well then you end up justifying all sorts of things and we've seen that don't we in terms of yeah. marketing and manipulation and control and and colonization and uh, and, and all sorts of things um we end up doing it because we think the end is to be out there and reaching people. Mm. But actually the end is to, to mirror the work of God in the world and to alert mm. people to his way. And secondarily, ideally, yeah. serve people, people, heal people, invite people into faith. But yeah, it, it, you know, you end up, you can end up in some very tricky space if yeah. you don't continually come back to Jesus. Yeah. So how, how do you think that we as, as people, uh, can be the ones that have our desire uh, and our attachment to God more than our strategies and all the other stuff to build the, the, the numbers so we look good. How can we stay grounded and rooted in that so that we keep him at the center um, as we move forward? Well, I mean, I think we need to maintain our evangelical kind of fervor. I know that that word's a bit contested, but that kind of gospel dr drive, which yeah. is sort of characteristic of a certain section of the Protestant community. But I also think we need to maintain some traditions that Catholic, Orthodox and mainline Protestants are committed to as well, which is about, you know, strong commitment to the to tradition, to reading scripture, to the lectionary, to, to grounding ourselves in the word. It's so interesting that the people mm. that often talk about how we're the gospel people, we're the word people, <laughs> are often the ones that seem to know it the least. Yeah. And so I'm not suggesting let's all, you know, be Catholic or let's all switch over to, to um, kind of more mainline or liberal uh, denominations or, or church movements, but maintaining our evangelical in the best sense of the word kind of energy and fervor and mm -hmm. commitment to mission it is actually about being people of the word and in particular yeah. people the gospel so i know that that just sounds so um <laughs> trite but it never ceases to amaze me how many people i can encounter who are very committed christian people and maybe even in ministry or mission yeah. uh, who know kind of not a whole lot about the gospels yeah. I mean, they know Jesus died for their sins and they know some stories and parables. And you know, I'm not suggesting they don't know anything, but in a sense, it's kind of like, I got it. Jesus mm. died for my sin. Right, good. Got that yeah. one. Now move on. But no, actually, there's so much more that you don't know if you don't really immerse yourself in the in the texts. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, was going to say, I teach a unit uh, at, uh, at the college where I teach on, uh, it's called Jesus and the Gospels. It's really mm. an introduction to the, mainly the synoptic Gospels, but we do touch a bit on John. And now these are committed Christian people who are yeah. in an MPOV or a, a Bachelor of Theology program. And, 
they're intending many of them to head head toward a kind of clergy track, um, either kind of local ministry or overseas mission. And no offense to them, God love them. I mean, they're kind of wide-eyed and full of curiosity and want to learn. But I end up teaching them stuff. I think, how do you not know this? Like, what what was going on in church? I mean, yeah. In a sense, I feel like Joshua, because lots of our lots of our leaders were raised in Christian families, they were raised in the church. They're not new converts to to, yeah. to Christianity, because many of them were. They've kind of adopted the gospel by osmosis, you know, mm. their, their family yeah. culture, their church culture. There's just things you know without really knowing them. Mm. And the thing that hits you, the thing that really uh, impacts you mm. is usually a, the, the message about uh, Christ's atoning sacrifice and your sin and your brokenness. Yeah. And often the conversion moment happens for them when it's like yes i am a sinner christ died for me and mm. and you capitulate into his arms of grace and yeah. you say i you know, that's when i became a christian and, and that's the thing that's like super important to you and i i get that mm. but all the other stuff is just as important yeah about the kingdom of god about the character of jesus about his whole upside down kingdom all that kind of stuff um but that's kind of way back in the mm. back of your mind as it were what's at the forefront is jesus died for my sins i've got to go tell other people about mm. that as well yeah and well i guess what i'm suggesting is just become more self-conscious about what you've assumed about the gospels mm. but not actually truly investigated and and brought to mm. the forefront to know and the, the thing about those classes is that you know when we teach them that sort of stuff, you just see them come alive. Like, oh, that is that why he said that? Oh, and so that's that make that, that makes sense of why later he does. And yeah. you see them put all the pieces together. Yeah. yeah, there are so many things that you know. Even for us leading a, a missions agency, is we're training missionaries to go out and and you know do a lot of work. You know, we're we're talking about hey, how can we go in and look at what what first century you know, Palestinian area looked like and who was he actually talking to? What was the cultural setting there? And, you know, we read things so much through a Western uh, perspective that we miss a lot of what Jesus was actually saying in those stories that he's sharing, the parables, the stories of him going into the, you know, the Pharisee house. And what does that look like? So how, what's the importance of actually knowing the context um, of what Jesus was and it, and then is, and how can we apply that to our lives? Yeah, no, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Yeah. And I mean, the thing about that is that then lots of preachers, I mean, you know, you look at these stories, parables or stories of Jesus' miraculous powers or his interactions with his uh, disciples, or of course, his, his death and resurrection, his birth narrative, you, you, you you look at them in these through these Western eyes, and then those people become ministers or missionaries, and then they they yeah. preach them through Western eyes, and so then people adopt a kind of a photocopy of a photocopy of a Western-eyed view of this, and so uh, in the end it just gets boring. I mean, I guarantee you, all <laughs> with the story of Christmas yeah. or the story of Easter, no one's going to admit it. Like. Yeah, I know, Gethsemane and the arrest, humiliation, he died on the cross. Mm. Like, yeah, heard it a million times. Yeah. And partly because I don't think it is often presented, not just Easter or Christmas stories, but all of it, as you yeah. just say, with the kind of cultural richness, the texture, that, that he would have said this for these reasons, and his first hearers would have heard it that way. Yeah. And I mean, not only, not only Jesus, of course, uh, even the rest of the New Testament, you know, Paul's and Peter's epistles and the like, you know, it's like this is what his churches would have heard when he said that, or this is why he alludes to this or that. Some preachers do that a little bit more on the epistles. It seems like there's more interest in those, but I feel like there needs to be just as much, if not more, interest on the whole personal work of, of Jesus. I mean, one of the guys who really helped me with this was um, Kenneth Bailey, you know, who... Yep. Um, uh, was a, a missionary in various places in the Middle East for 40 years or something yep. like um, uh, just an incredibly gracious, kind, mm. godly. I had a great 
privilege of meeting with him, speaking at a conference with him mm. uh, toward the end of his life, and just the most humble, gracious guy who had done the most remarkable mm. things and didn't big note himself yeah. about it at all. But you know, he his work in particular, Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes, is his yeah. big fat book. But I <laughs> remember. What, yeah, we have our, our missionaries read through that. You know, we have them every every week for a year, learn a new Jesus story, and then read right. Jesus through Middle Eastern eyes of that that story, and that's really helpful. Right. It's it's wonderful. Uh, highly recommended. Yeah. He told me a great story. Can I tell you this? Story? Yeah, said that love it. He was in uh, Beirut when, do you remember when all the, the Americans were getting kidnapped, you know, during mm. the, the Civil War there, and... Um, and the, the British envoy Terry Waite was kidnapped, and I mean it was like pretty, it yeah. was pretty hard on on Westerners or well Americans and British people in Lebanon at that time. And the Baileys were there as missionaries, and he said after a particular, um, I think it was when Ben Weir was was kidnapped. The Marines kind of came into uh, Beirut and just sort of said, "We're airlifting every American out of out of Beirut. Like, grab your stuff and yeah. get in this truck or helicopter or whatever." It was like, you know, military operation. <laughs> just sucked all the Americans mm. out. And um, but the Baileys said, "Thank you, but no, thank you. You know, we're, yeah. we're called to, so we'll stay." And he tells this story about how the next day he went, he and his wife walked down to the store to buy bread and coffee, which you did every day. So it's not an unusual thing to do. Yep. So he walked down the street and joined a queue to a line to, um, to buy bread. And he said, as we were walking, we noticed that all these blinds and curtains were fluttering as people were like looking out their windows <laughs> at us. And he said, as we stood in the line, People were coming up to shake our hand or to mm. hug us or to, to, to pat our shoulder. And we didn't say anything. We didn't do anything. It's mm. just, and he says, he said, that's what I learned. He said that um, presence yeah. can have as much power as anything mm. that we say. Mm. And just this beautiful image of this silent couple, not preaching, not handing out tracts, not, yeah. but just saying, we didn't leave. We are mm. in solidarity you that mm. spoke to their neighbors it was a beautiful story of, of of risky missional presence yeah that's so good i love that story and i love that you know just being present with people you know as we were thinking through some some context you know my wife and i lived in the middle east for for some years and worked primarily with syrian refugees and you know one of the first uh believers that we found a muslim background believer um she came to jesus one of the pivotal points was the christmas story but when the the angel came to the shepherd and said i bring you good news and glad tidings for all people she stopped us in the middle of that and she said is jesus really for all people and we said yes jesus is for all people and she said i thought he was just for you christians i didn't know he was for us muslims too and so because he was for all people, and I think, you know, that story, you know, there, angels going to the shepherds, I think spoke to her as well, right? Because she, as a, a refugee coming across the border and living and going, well, look at this and look at the, the announcement coming into the, the shepherd, which was, you know, she was very rural type shepherding people that she came from um and she said oh jesus is actually for me too it was just beautiful to see that yeah and you think about the way we often tell in the west that story and it's it sort of feels um almost kind of pixar or disney like you know it's like it's in a it's in a an a-framed sort of gabled yeah. uh, 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 what do you call it stable and uh there's a, there's a star perched right on top and everyone's positioned according to height. And, um, you know, there's a kind of a, a glossing over of the dirtiness and the richness of it. So, yeah. you know, shepherds, which is what this woman really responded to, but, you know, so much, so many people who have lived and worked in the Middle East would say that couple weren't alone in some shed or stable at the back. I mean, yeah. they were in a home there was this extended family of Joseph there who would have attended to, to Mary. She was clearly in the area where animals were kind of mm. kept at yeah. night. 
because there's no room anywhere else. I mean, there are, you know, but there, there are ways in which Middle Eastern people would respond to a woman in labour. I mean, it, it wouldn't just yeah. be like, shut up the back, you know. You know, when people retell it, like, it feels real and it feels, yeah. It, also, it's not kind of diminishing the kind of the richness of Middle Eastern hospitality and all yeah. those kinds of things that, that Middle Eastern people would assume when they read the story, but we in the West who have our individual homes and if all yeah. our rooms were full, we would say, well, why don't you try the garage, you know, but, <laughs> but, but could you imagine if you've, if you've lived and worked there, like, could you imagine uh, that ever happening in a Middle Eastern context <laughs> to Never. an extended, <laughs> no. you know, a distant relative and his, and his betrothed, she's going to labor. Like, I mean, but when you hear it in those in those terms, there's such richness and beauty and this yeah. and, and then the whole notion of like the, the persecution of infants and the need to escape and be refugees themselves. And you know, there's there's it's it's a knife edge story. It's a kind of a brutal story. Yeah. It's a story of a very uh, vulnerable, tiny little mm. family with geopolitics swirling around, and then you bring in the cosmic notions of, you know, angels and stars and weird guys from the East coming <laughs> over. And it's, uh, yeah, there's something yeah. very yeah. about it, but um, the Christmas card version of it doesn't do the trick. Yeah, that's true. You know, you just uh, re-released uh, Read Jesus. Re you revised and updated it with Alan Hirsch. Um, why did you guys decide this is the time to do that with Read Jesus? Yeah, well, it came out in 2008. Yep, eight, I think. And um, I'm not that onto this kind of sort of stuff as Alan is, but Alan <laughs> said, well, you know, he had a, another book come out that year, and I think I did. And he said, I think that book kind of got a bit lost with mm. us putting out too many books, um, which is probably true, I don't know. But th the other thing, too, is that we've just felt that since 2008, and in particular what's felt like a real acceleration of um, the, uh, the the breaking confidence that Americans in particular have with evangelical mm. Christianity. Yeah. The, 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 that word, I mean, I mentioned that word earlier and said, you know, yeah. evangelical is this term because that, that's a trigger term these days. Evangelicals yeah. are not well regarded and <laughs> followers of Jesus particularly the loud ones, are, are not respected. Mm. Um, we just have to own that. We just have to acknowledge yeah. that. You can, you know, you might want to disagree with me. Maybe you might not, but others might want to disagree yeah. with me as to why that's happened. But uh, rather than getting into that, just acknowledging that the reputation of the evangelical or Protestant church is, has just gone down and down and down. Yeah. And yet we're, the, we're the, the loudest ones about being the Jesus people. And so mm. Alan and I just felt, we felt this way in 2008 when we wrote it. It's like we've got to re-Jesus our church. We've got to be known as the Jesus people. And yeah. I mean, in that book, we start by telling the story of how, you know, the Ku Klux Klan, before they would go out, you know, uh, <laughs> we tell of a particular night when before they went out and, and kidnapped a group of white civil rights workers who had come down from the north to to be in Alabama, uh, Mississippi, sorry, um, uh, working uh, with the civil rights movement, right before they went out and kidnapped these guys and then murdered them, uh, mm. one of the chaplains of the Ku Klux Klan praised this very beautiful prayer about the Lord blessing us and being with us mm. and and you could pray that prayer in just about any church, to be quite frank. But that prayer is prayed to kind of bless them on their way as they go out in their kind of murderous rampage. Now, mm. you, you know, think of examples of Nazis doing that and of, 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 yeah. of Cossacks doing that. And, and uh, you, you know, you can think of, uh, of um, even, even with sort of the, the response to um, the election of Donald Trump and... Uh, the storming yeah. of the Capitol and all those sorts of things, you think that people holding placards about Jesus in, 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 in yeah. this situation. It's not as brutal as going off to murder civil rights workers, but you're terrorising politicians and staff in the in the Capitol building. Um, they had no clue what was going to happen. It was, quite, it was terrible. I mean, no one yeah. could justify it. Um, so how do you slap Jesus' name on that and say that, you know, 
uh, as you'll probably know, Joshua, like there, there are people praying in the Capitol building, like protesters yeah. praying in the Capitol building as if God yeah. was with us, this violent rampage. And so, yeah, we just felt like, oh, come on, like has anything changed? Maybe yeah. well, clearly the message didn't get through. <laughs> what would it look like if we refreshed this book, mm. you know, particularly for our current age? And not just to, it's not just an attack on, it's not an attack at all on Trump supporters or anything like that. We, we avoid kind of talking about politics or any of that stuff. We just say there's a real problem here uh, yeah. around the way evangelicals are known for their politics or for their conservative right. values or those yeah. sorts of things. Not known mm. are they the people. They're the ones who try to be like Jesus. Mm. And that disconnect is deeply, deeply concerning mm. for us. Yeah, and it it seems it seems to me, you know, that we, uh, as the church, uh, have had some mission drift, and it doesn't take a miss a very large misalignment at the very beginning to eventually come and have a huge misalignment, you know, thirty years down the road, um, because you're just veering off so far right or left. Um, so how, how can we start to, um, to read Jesus and how, how do, what's a process that we can do as the church to get back into alignment with Christ as the center, um, as we're moving forward and not stay veered off way too far right? Well, I think that there has to first be a, a, a significant process of, of repentance and um now not everyone listening to this was storming the capital i'm not talking about like repent of those things not many yeah. of you none of you driving cars into black lives matter you know um uh, marches or like these are extreme examples but we're all part of a system which has become so polarized politically and so oriented around concerns for our, for our own religious freedom or for our places, the, the church in society, or demanding that our particular values be followed by everyone in society. <clears throat> it's not, I'm not here commenting on those values per se, but our arrogance and mm-hmm. our need to be right and listened to and um, it has just led to a diminishing of our reputation. And I think divesting ourselves of this, I mean, we have to come to a point collectively where we can say, oh, I take certain views on certain ethical uh, concerns in society, but primarily I'm concerned about mirroring or presenting Jesus in the midst of this. And so left and right, black and white, Asian and Latina, Latina, are coming together on their knees and repenting and saying we, we yeah. put it all down. Like we, you know, we, we've got to move to a place where where we can acknowledge our own brokenness and the mm-hmm. fact that so much of what we've put our hand to has not opened people's eyes to Jesus. Mm-hmm. Um, I posted something on social media the other day about um, there was a kind of a, a, a meme where it says like the Christians are crying out for revival. And what God does is he exposes all the corruption and abuses in in church. And then the Christians say, oh, Satan, you know, Satan's attacking us by exposing all these things. And you think, what would it be if we didn't wake up and we think to ourselves, all of these high profile leaders, um, all of these gigantic churches, big movements, the Acts 29, Mars Hill, Hillsong, yeah. you know, there's they're crumbling well some of them disappear they're, they're, yeah. their reputations are crumbling individual so sort of celebrity pastors and reputations now have become mud now it's it's like accelerating at a pace yeah. Very and, and before all of that of course it, the same thing was happening in the catholic church with the exposing yeah. of like all rings or nests of pedophile priests in certain cities across yeah. My country, yours, Ireland, and places like that. It it feels like a great unveiling, like a, like yeah. God is like peeling back, like this, this the, the taking the lid off this kind of this fettered, you know, out of date mm. food stuff yeah. or something. It's like oh, it stinks. <laughs> like actually, that's part of the process, isn't it? It's yep. just like we've been exposed. Like yeah, 
Mm. At its worst, this is what we come to. And I know there are people listening to this who say, I'm not a pedophile and, and I'm not a high profile leader who's committed some sexual sin and I'm not a pedophile priest and I'm not a, you know, a, a, a capital building invader. No, we're not. I don't, you're not and I'm yeah. not. But acknowledging that we are all seen as Jesus followers, as part of this kind yeah. of world, I think repentance is the first mm. step. I mean, Alan Hirsch is writing a book at the moment on repentance uh, yeah. and saying this is the first step. Like we've just got to get to, get to our knees and lay it all down and mm. as as one church, not as the left, not as the right. I mean, they're yeah. both as bad as each other in so many respects, so um, in different ways, but um, just dropping to our knees and, and coming to Christ empty-handed mm saying remake us like reshape mm. us grow us afresh mm. uh, and then of course back into the text back to jesus as we were saying yeah. about before like, who is this that we're talking about is this republican jesus you know is this right. black lives Matter jesus is this kind of left-wing liberal jesus is no no it's just jesus let's just go back to the yeah. person of jesus which you know as we said before isn't necessarily easy to understand in our own context mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure if we encountered him today, he would piss us all off in some way or other. <laughs> That's in true. Different ways. So <laughs> now he, he him is like one of the first kids. Uh, yeah, and I think you know how do we get Christianity to be less of uh, a religious institution and more of a, an embodiment of Christ? What does that look like? Um, we have that repentance, but what are, what are those next things that we could get to get rid of that religious institution of Christianity and just embody Christ um, and yeah. just move forward into the world that way? Yeah, and I mean, I think that that's, um, that's the undoing of so much of that kind of leadership class is about their reliance on institutional um uh, devices or paraphernalia like non-disclosure agreements or yeah. the silence of the critics or i mean this is just what jesus reacted against you know i mean i always think of when jesus says i am the good shepherd in uh, in john chapter 10 that seems lovely like that's like oh the good shepherd that sounds good but he's that conversation what he's saying in john chapter 10 there comes out of his engagement with with the religious elite at the end of John chapter 9 when they have brutalized and humiliated and and tried to silence a poor blind man who's been healed mm. by them. I mean his crime is he got healed by Jesus and oh, yeah the religious elite's treatment of him and his aged parents is just disgusting I mean it's just yeah it's a, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, that's after he spent a time saying, you are the bad shepherds. Like, mm. <laughs> you are you're leading people, you are crushing people, you are destroying people. Mm. Then the announcement is, but they'll hear my voice and they'll follow me because I'm the good shepherd. Yeah. We just jump to the good shepherd part. We don't want to hear the story about mm. how Jesus responds to religious elitism, which by its very nature often ends up in very toxic kind of places. Mm. You know, we we often miss that that <laughs> Jesus is prophet um, and calling us into into new spaces and calling out uh, the things that are not aligned. You know, he's calling us to live into the kingdom. And what does it look like? What does this kingdom of God look like? You know, I always go back to the very beginning of him announcing his ministry um, and you know rolling out the scroll of Isaiah sixty one. Um, you know, proclaiming good news to the poor, setting the captives free. And all the Jews were obviously excited that this may be the year of the Lord's favor. Like this is, is all for us. And then Jesus saying, no, you just remember, you know, with Elisha, uh, you know, there were a lot of lepers, but only Naaman the Syrian was, was healed. Um, Elijah went to the widow of Zarephath um, and not of the, any of the widows of Israel. And, they were like, okay, I'm going to throw you off a cliff. And we often forget that Jesus is, is this one that, that goes and provokes in such a way that calls people out to the margins, uh, to all people, um, and to the people that are not part of that community and are on the outside. And it really provokes uh, yeah. the ones that are in the, 
institution um, and wanting to see well, that. Actually, I mean, in the John 10 story, after berating them as being bad, bad shepherds, um, announcing himself as the good shepherd, he then, to your point, he then says, um, and I have I have sheep from other other pens that I will call, and they will yeah. join together with those who followed. And it's at that point that the, the Pharisees say, this man is insane. Like they literally mm. say, he's crazy. <laughs> he's just like, well, there's no point even arguing about this. This man is literally insane. Mm. That's the thing that, that tips them over the edge, the idea yeah. that, yeah, I'm going to call Israel to follow me, but I'm calling other tribes mm. who will come and yep. join us together. For them, that was just like unbelievable. <laughs> and, of course, they were so shaped by their fear of having been mm -hmm. you know, brutalized by invasion, of course, the exile, you know, generations before, but also mm -hmm. the invasion of the Greeks and now the Romans. And so they were terrified of the outsider. And in their terror, they then terrorized, mm -hmm. you know, the people of Israel themselves. Yeah. Um, so Jesus comes with this message of, I, I've come to bring you freedom. Like, yeah, well, yeah, I want you to be free indeed. No sheep wants to be kept in the pen. Yeah. Like, I had a shepherd tell me once that if you put sheep in the pen for too long, they will they will break their own necks trying to wow. fall over each other to get <laughs> out. Like, uh, you put them in there at night just to keep them safe. You release them as soon as the sun comes up. They start bleating and jumping around trying to get out. You release them because where's a sheep meant to be? Out on the hillsides, like out mm. roaming and uh, grazing. And so this image that Jesus presents is a beautiful one. It's like you have penned them in with all mm. your toxic rules and your fear and your control. Yeah. I throwing open the gate and I'm leaving them mm. out to free. That's a beautiful image. And their yeah, response to that is, you crazy. <laughs> That's very true. Uh, it's a, crazy, but it actually it reveals a lot about what the church is looking like at the moment of a you know trapped in sheep um, and that are not sent out into the into the wild to be able to follow Jesus because there's a lot of you know whatever it is trust issues or you know control issues, um, but it just reveals a lot that we need to press out. Uh, to the margins and and to go where Jesus would go. Um, how do we actually open up the gates and get get the sheep out um, so that we start to the world says, "Wow, you actually look like Jesus now." Yeah, well, the thing is, though, Joshua, that that's happening anyway. I mean, as much as church leaders might try to keep the gates shut and keep the system tight um you're finding it in positive ways people are slipping out and they're finding their way into yeah. mission agencies and parachurch organizations and they're, they're saying oh wow i'm serving here in a campus ministry yeah. or all nations or wherever and this is what church was meant to be all yeah. along it's alive it's collaborative it's yeah. intuitive it's it's deeply reliant on on the presence of of god and oh this is this is freedom or they're finding their way in less positive ways through really um, treacherous journeys of deconstruction. And, yeah. um, and the church just berates them and condemns them for this. But actually what they're doing is they're trying to find their way to the, yeah. to the, the beautiful green hillsides, you know, yeah. but they're trying to divest that which is stuck to them because mm. of this kind of toxic form of religion. And that's not an easy thing to do. So of course, a lot of people going through that process do throw out some good stuff as well as the bad stuff. And mm. there's no there's no rule, there's no roadmap for this. And then all you do then is get berated by the people back in the sheep pen or the, mm. the bad shepherds. And it just exacerbates your whole sense of, I will give up. I mean, you know, you kick them when they're down, but what they're doing is they're trying to follow Jesus to freedom. So, yep. um, so I think partly it might be that we need to... Uh, open the gates a little bit more. We need to actually help develop processes of deconstruction mm. and then reconstructed faith. Um, mm. But do you think I'm confident about that happening in a kind of institutional sense? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you I have my yeah. doubts about it. Yeah. 
And it's just going to, I mean, it is a messy process as we're following Jesus and trying to figure these things out, um, you know, and once we try yeah, Because to... what we discover is that like everyone out there isn't as unhappy as our church told us they were. And yeah. Everybody out there, marriage isn't as bad as they told us they were. They aren't all alcoholics or getting abortions every chance they have. Like what we discovered was like, and not just good American people, like, you know, there's good yeah. Syrian people and there's, oh, there's, yeah. there's good, there's good Muslim people and there's good Buddhist people. And, you know, we're discovering that, um, there's life everywhere and that God is present everywhere. Yeah. And it's like, well, what did I need that thing back there for? And mm. so it's, um, you know, um, mm. had a, a, do you remember that movie, um, uh, Finding Nemo, when Nemo yeah. gets sort of, uh, you know, uh, fished out of the Great Barrier Reef and put into a into an aquarium at the dentist yeah. uh, <laughs> dentist uh, surgery, and um, the first thing that happens, all the fish in the aquarium, all us all go to the edges of the aquarium, like keep away from him because he's dirty, like he's yeah. filthy. And so mm. Pierre the prawn has to come out and like you know clean him mm. so that they can engage with him, and I think. It sounds so much like conversion, isn't it? It's yeah, like, it go on, like, clean him up wow. and make him look like one of us. Yeah. And, um, and then the kind of the, the conceit of that picture is that you could get flushed down the toilet and it'll actually take you back out to the ocean <laughs> and you can, uh, you can swim back to the Great Barrier Reef. But here's the thing, like if you put your pet goldfish or your pet tropical fish in the river system or drop them in the ocean, you yeah. know, they die like immediately yeah. because they become so cloistered. They become so yeah. used to this perfectly designed mm. ecosystem. Yeah. They don't have the capacity to live in the wild. And mm. I suspect that's what a lot of our, what our churches do. Yeah. I think that's a lot of what our youth ministries do and young yeah. adult ministries. They're about keeping you away from mm. the wild blue ocean i switched from rolling green hills to wild blue ocean with my metaphors <laughs> here but, um it's like don't go out there it's disgusting and filthy and so so mm. much of our youth ministry is about how do we keep you out of that how do we get yeah. you to find a, a you know a good christian boyfriend or girlfriend mm. how do we stop you taking drugs reading these books watching those movies doing this doing that mm. it's like we're pierre the prawns we're just cleaning people over and over and over and over mm. And then when they go off to university, off to college somewhere, or they get a job somewhere, and blah, they just like completely <laughs> die, as it were. Yeah. Then we ask ourselves, what was wrong with their faith? Well, maybe mm. what was wrong with the way we discipled them? What was yeah. wrong with the way we equipped them to live in the world as a Jesus mm. follower with confidence and vitality mm. and life, experiencing God's presence, mm. trusting in Jesus, finding other Christians to, to find fellowship with and partnership mm. with, but also engaging in the world. What was wrong with the way we raised our, our young people as Christians? Hmm. Wow. I love that analogy. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, the story of the woman with the issue of blood that coming and touching Jesus's robe. And, you know, everybody said, hey, you are going to be defiled if, you know, she touches you. Like, and, uh, you know, their power went out of him. She was healed. He said, who touched me? And she was quivering in fear because she knew that, you know, she was defiled and she was defiling this beautiful man, Jesus. Um, but he wasn't defiled. He was the one, as he was touched, he was actually able to make things clean uh, and whole. And it's as we go out, um we're actually not going to be defiled, um, yeah. but there actually can be a transformation um, that happens in the places and the people that we start to encounter. Yeah, there's a kind of a fear about the fragility of the gospel that can easily be yeah. broken or shattered. There's a, a fear about the fragility of the Holy Spirit at work in us that we could easily, as you say, yeah. be defiled by, by contact with someone who doesn't share the same faith as us. I don't know where that originally comes from, but the anxiety that, um, that really it's a very fragile thing. If you carry yeah. it outside, you could drop it. You could break right. it. Um, it's unhealthy, isn't it? Yeah. You know, the other thing I love about that story is that, um, you know when Jesus berates the Pharisees for having the long tassels on their robes? Yeah. You know, and when I first read that, I thought, 
what does he care about the tax? Is it like that's that's a that's a kind of conceit, or that's like you're 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 being too kind of frivolous or something? But mm-hmm. actually, it comes from the idea that people thought that if you could touch the tassels on the garment of a rich of a of a religious leader, mm-hmm. that there was power, there was healing mm-hmm. in the in that, which is rubbish. Mm-hmm. And even the Pharisees yeah. would say, no, no, that's not true. But they would still stitch long tassels on their clothes to kind of tempt people to like mm. check out how holy I am. Like, you know, maybe if you touched me, you might get healed. Like, but, but then if someone said, oh, if I touched that, no, 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 there's no nothing, no power in my clothing, but they still would wear these tassels. And then Jesus is just like, look at you. What are you thinking? Mm-hmm. But in the in that context, this woman believes the lie. Yeah. That if you touch yeah. the, the garment of a holy man, you would be healed. So she's, mistaken she's wrong there's no power in his clothing she touches him under this misapprehension that she could be healed and as you said (laughs) what she is healed like she steals this miracle from jesus wow and i just think there's something so beautiful (laughs) about that even in your ignorance yeah even in your kind of limited perspective god still can reach out and touch you (laughs) And then as you really well beautifully put it, it's like she's quivering because she thinks she's now in trouble for stealing this miracle. But actually Jesus brings her into the assembly of men and says, it was your faith that healed you. Like he elevates her as a heroic woman of faith. Like it's just, oh, I get get shivers (laughs) when I retell that story. Mm, That's beautiful. It's beautiful. I have a couple questions at the end. One is, if you could go back to your 21-year-old self, what advice would you give? Uh, I would probably tell myself to slow down and hmm. you don't, there's not, well, now that I know, I'm 60 years old now, so I know you got another 40 years at yeah. least left in you, Michael. <laughs> so I would say... <laughs> You don't have to pass the exam all in, in you know, one year. Like, learn these things, sit mm. with them, soak into them. You don't have to write that book now or preach that sermon now or win that mm. that fight now, whatever it might be. Yeah. So I would I'd say immerse yourself much more in your faith, journey more slowly. I'm sure mm. God will take you where he wants you to go. Mm. Um, and, I would, yeah, I think I would also say... Um, it's a good question that you mentioned. What I say, slow down, immerse myself more in what I'm doing. I think probably be kinder to people that are on the same journey as you, yeah. or are at the same point of the journey as you. Yeah. I mean, years ago, I wasn't 21, I was older than that, but Alan Hirsch and I wrote a book called The Shaping of Things to Come, which um, was a pretty obnoxious kind of book, to be quite honest. It pretty much... <laughs> pretty much began with hey you're doing everything wrong but here here's how you should be doing it and it did it did annoy a lot of people and um we ended up doing another edition of that too which we kind of ameliorated some of that kind of Mm. pretty pretty aggressive kind of language but um but yeah i just discovered this whole kind of missional way of thinking and it was Mm. just like Hey everyone, you're doing everything completely wrong, yeah. and everything you think is wrong. Here's the why. And I think I'd say to a younger version of me, just present the gold. Just if it is gold, yeah. present what it is that you've discovered. Invite people in, in, in a kinder way to kind mm. of journey in the process yeah. with you. Yeah. I said this once to someone else, and they said, "Yeah, but maybe not as many people would have taken as much notice of it if they weren't as <laughs> as annoyed by it as they were." <laughs> yeah, I did have a guy come up to me once, and he gave me a copy of his book to sign. It was battered; it looked like a car had run over it. And he said, "I read like ten pages, and I'd throw it against the wall, and then I'd pick them up and read another ten pages." So, you know, for some reason, they kept reading these people. But yeah, no, I think I'd say you go slower, immerse yourself mm. more, be kinder. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, anything you've been reading or watching lately you could recommend? Well, I'm writing a book on the history of Christian missions. So I've been reading a <laughs> lot of stuff about history. Actually. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I think, that, you know, we didn't mention this earlier in our conversation, but 
uh, not only do we look through Western eyes yeah. and not Middle Eastern eyes to understand the scriptures, we also think about mission through very limited historical eyes. You know, yep. we think about mission in America over the last 30, 40 years. Like that's the way it's always been, right? Yeah. Or we jump way back to the early church. Like, so we think of the Jerusalem church. Yeah. You know, Calvinists love Geneva and, you know, uh, and then there's a bit of Jonathan Edwards and some Great Awakening stuff, Billy Graham, and now this. <laughs> and you think, oh, yeah, you know, like, <laughs> I mean, everyone I just mentioned then was male for a start. Like yeah. you have all these extraordinary women doing remarkable mission around the world. Yeah. But also, I'm working. My working title with this book is uh, "Mission is the Shape of Water," and mm. um, the idea that water doesn't lose its inherent qualities. It's H two O, but it is shaped differently depending on what container yeah. it's placed. And uh, I know there was a movie called "The Shape of Water," which was about about love and sexuality and the like but i think you can also say this about mission it's like hmm. mission will always be mission it's about alerting yeah. people to the universal reign of god through christ but yeah. when you pour it into the container of engaging with um, syrian refugees it's going yeah. to be shaped differently yeah. when you pour it to engaging with you know uh, uh, business people in in southern california it's going to be shaped differently yeah. when you tr try to do mission uh on the border between Poland and Ukraine, and you're, you're dealing with refugees from traumatized refugees from yeah. a war zone, it's going to look different. It's going to look different in Africa, and it's going to look different throughout different periods of history. So yeah. that's a lot of what I've been reading hmm. lately. It's just like, um, the, it's just broaden our horizons <laughs> so that we can actually see God has been using people hmm. in all of these ways, not just the few that we have yeah. in our mind. Are there any particular missionaries that uh, in the in the past that have just fascinated you? Oh my gosh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, Nicholas von Zinzendorf, who was the kind of the yep. not the founder, but the kind of the the, the patron, I suppose, of the um, of the the um, Moravian uh, movement. Probably, probably the beginning of the modern missions movement. Yep. Like Baptists like to give credit to William Carey, but. Uh, the Moravians were like, you know, a step ahead of, yeah. of the rest of the Protestants and did remarkable things. But, you know, I, I think Francis Xavier, I mean, you know, Protestants yeah. don't know anything about Francis Xavier, but I mean, that guy, like, you know, he planted churches or, or you know, Christian missions in, in India, Indonesia, mm -hmm. China, Japan. I mean, that was like, us saying, oh, well, Joshua, he started mission work in Jupiter, Mars. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is like, you know, this is unbelievable back in the 1500s as this guy was doing this. And, mm. um, you know, he was a Jesuit, and I know Jesuits did some pretty bad stuff in mission, you know, subsequently. But um, I found him to be a fascinating character. Mm. Mary Slessor's work among uh, uh, Nigerians was remarkable, I think. Uh, but I've also come across some indigenous church apostles, I suppose, in Southern Africa and mm. uh, people who just almost without any contact with missionaries came mm. to faith and came to a set of beliefs that mirrored basic Christian theology mm. and led whole movements of people around wow. uh, places in, let's say, the Southern Africa among the Shosa people. Mm. Um, uh, I, I just finished writing a section of the story about these two Baptist missionaries in the Congo. Hmm. She was given a camera like way back in the early, early 1900s when cameras yeah. were like no ordinary people had them. Uh, and they said, oh, take some photos. Who knows? People might find it interesting to see what life is like. I mean, could you imagine a missionary now without a camera? But anyway, um, <laughs> And at that time, there was a genocide going on in the in the jungles of the Congo by the Belgian colonizers. So she ended up photographing and recording mm. these these horrific murders. They were published in the UK. That set off a scandal, which eventually led to the to the Belgians having to leave the Congo. Mm. I mean, just stories like that. That's wow. mission. Yeah. Do mission will work with a camera. Mm. Or, uh, I read a story about a missionary guy who carried a a full printing press through the jungle to get to Uganda so he could print Bibles. Um, mm. You know, yeah. everyone's heard about uh, about uh, uh, Livingston and Carey and, yeah. and 
Oliver and uh, Hudson Taylor. They're great stories too, but there are so many remarkable stories mm. of ordinary people yep. who just went and let mission be shaped by the context in which they found mm. themselves. That's great. I'm really excited to read that. When's, when are you going to finish that? <laughs> you think i'm gonna finish it soon but who knows when it's gonna come out <laughs> well, that'd be good well uh yeah mike it was such a, a pleasure to talk to you today and uh i really really enjoyed it and, and walking through what does it actually look like to start to become more like jesus more like jesus in the church and uh to go out to i enjoy it too. i really enjoy it. open the pen exactly be, be exactly. sheep in the wild so yeah so thank you so much Thanks, Joshua. Thank you for listening to the show today. If you're really enjoying the show, please don't forget to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast app. You could do it right now. Just hit that little plus. Um, and then I would love it if you would leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. So you could go right now to the show and leave a star rating uh, and review and let us know how you are enjoying the show. And find us on Facebook and Instagram. So if you want to connect, interact, uh, I post a lot of quotes and different things that you could actually interact with the episodes and let me know how you are enjoying the show. If you feel inclined to donate, uh, there is a support the show link in the show notes, um, and it would send you directly to a page where you could donate so that new episodes can be produced for your enjoyment. So thank you so much for listening, uh, and I hope you have an incredible week.